Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webinar, GDPR Considerations for your IBM Domino Environment. Uh, we're here with Ben Manessi, our head of product, and he's going to be talking to you about a whole bunch of points that can be applied to your IBM Domino environment that will help you mitigate any risks and uh, get rid of any risks of penalties uh, when the GDPR hits this coming May. Um, and just before we get started, I want to make sure that you know that we're going to have a Q&A section on the chat. Um, we're going to be answering your questions as much as we can. And for all of you watching on YouTube, uh, just feel free to type in your questions into the comments and we'll try to get to those as well. So with that, let's get started. Ben, uh, what are we talking about today? Well, hey, Mike and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Is my audio okay, Mike? Yep, it's good for me here. All right, perfect. So, as uh, Mike said, we're going to be talking about the GDPR um, today, the European General Data Protection Regulation. But we're going to taking we're going to be taking a little bit of a different approach to the whole subject. Um, than what I'm pretty sure most of you have seen attending other webinars on the subject or doing the reading yourself. Um, so let me just sort of introduce what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, one of the things that I noticed is that there's a lot of great webinars out there that discuss the GDPR very much in detail, which uh, is actually an over 80 pages documentation if you really wanna go through it, which I sort of did. And uh, the, the problem with this is that it's pretty hard to translate to tangible tasks in order for you to know what you need to do should you receive, for example, a subject data subject request about an IBM Domino environment. So we're going to be focusing very heavily today on the technical side of things and what is involved in all of this. Now, um, while we're gonna be focusing on Domino, I do wanna go through some of the basics and um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I do wanna give a shout out to Florian Fogler from Pan Agenda, who did a great webinar on the subject, uh, not so much about Domino, but the GDPR itself. So go ahead and uh, check that out if you're interested in more details. Um, we're gonna be starting with the GDPR overview, um, then walk on to data subject rights. So what is it that data subjects are allowed to ask of you as of May 25th um, this year? And then we're gonna move on to Domino specific examples because what it really comes down to is Domino as a data container. Uh, we'll be debunking some of the hoaxes that you might've seen on the internet, which pretty much flat out say that Domino can never be compliant with the GDPR which is simply false. And so we're gonna look at the advantages and disadvantages of Domino from the GDPR perspective. Um, but uh, I mean, spoiler alert, Domino can, as a matter of fact, be made compliant with the GDPR. We'll talk a lot about searching Domino because it is an integral part of being compliant. Um, and we will talk about our tools. I mean, this is a White Tree webinar. Um, I don't know about you guys, and I don't know about your mileage with the GDPR. I've attended a ton of webinars from other companies who basically just formulated their um, topics about GDPR around their products. I want to avoid this, um, but the honest truth here is that Domino does lack some of the native capabilities of, for example, enterprise searches, which is something that we have tools for. So whether you're a white tree customer or you never really heard about us, um, I hope that this will be interesting. We'll be doing some live demos and you will be able to test all of this on your own. All right, so let's talk about the GDPR. Really, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction here. Um, if I wanted to put it into one sentence, what it's really about is it provides the means for you as an EU citizen to better control your personal and sensitive data um, that are processed and controlled by companies. So basically, whoever you trust with your data will have much more strict guidelines on how they can deal with them. You know how they say the internet never forgets? Well, after the GDPR, 
it will kind of have to. So that's kind of what this is all about. Now, before we go into the nitty gritty details, I actually came across this uh, paper from the Boston Consulting Group uh, last night. It's a really awesome paper and it kind of introduces the reasons of why the GDPR is so important. This is one image that I took from the paper that sort of tells us based on their survey in six different countries in the EU, is that the median of people, of consumers who basically don't trust companies, they believe companies are not being honest about the way they use their personal data is about 52%. Yeah? So when you look at France, 62% of people do not trust what companies say about dealing with their data, which is sort of the reason of this whole thing in the first place. Now, let's actually get started with some definitions here. I'm going to be super fast because I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with these things. But just to make sure, we're going to talk about data controllers. Um, basically, this is the natural or legal person or entity that is, um, that is determining the purpose of and the means of processing your personal data. Now, in our case, when it comes to Domino, this will be your organization who deals with data subjects, personal data, whether that's customers or HR or internal employees. The data processor is a little bit different because in the case of, for example, Domino on-premises installations, the controller and processor is gonna be the same. However, if you were to use, or if you're using IBM Smart Cloud, then for those mail files that are in the IBM Smart Cloud, um, IBM would actually be the data processor. However, you will still be the data controller. And so it's also your liability and your responsibility to, to comply with the GDPR. And of course, the most important thing here is the data subject. This is what GDPR really is about. It's the living individual um, whose personal data we're talking about. Um, so we're talking about European citizens that personal data identifies in your IT environment. All right, um, a little bit about the basics. A little known fact about the GDPR is that it actually repeals and strengthens a directive that, have been, that has been in place since 95. Um, and this directive actually outlines most of the principles that the GDPR will define much more effectively. In a way, we can think of the difference between these two um, by thinking about the uh, principle of being innocent until proven guilty, which sort of is true for the directive and the GDPR turns it around, which means that uh, you actually have to prove um, that you're innocent as opposed to being proven guilty. What does this actually mean? A couple of examples here. Like I said, this directive has been in place for a long time now. Um, the directive is actually very vague when it comes to a lot of things. Uh, for example, data subjects were always allowed to ask for their data or ask about their personal data. However, according to the directive, the controller did not really have any time limitation where the GDPR strictly defines one month as the limit of time within which you need to get back to the data subject. Another example is the... Um, is the cost of these data subject requests. While um, as part of the directive, companies were allowed to charge a small fee, thereby to sort of discourage data subjects from requiring data about their personal information, the GDPR defines that this is free. Um, and so companies must comply with these access requests or whatever requests we're talking about. Um, now, the other thing about GDPR is that it is already in effect. It has actually been approved by the European Parliament in April 2016, but it is to be enforced as of May 25th, 2018. So the regulation is already in effect. Member states have a little bit of liberty here, but while because of the directive's vagueness before, it was largely up to member states to toughen those rules. And if you look at Germany, they already have some really tough data privacy laws in place. With the GDPR, there's actually less wiggle room here, even though their member states are allowed to make changes um, and improvements to the GDPR, 
one of the principles here is that it cannot weaken the principles outlined in the GDPR. And so, of course, uh, you're probably familiar with the fines, which are extremely hefty. Um, it can be 10 million euros or 2% of worldwide turnover for failing um, uh, responsibilities. Uh, this is basically about smaller stuff. Like if you don't comply with the time limits and stuff like that, I mean, smaller stuff, it's an insane pen penalty in any case, but it can actually go up to 20 million euros or 4% of worldwide turnover, whichever is higher, um, if you fail to comply with the privacy by design. So with the core of the GDPR. So it's extremely important to make sure that you're compliant because of these fees as well. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about consent. Consent is a key principle of the GDPR. Essentially, this is about the fact that as an organization, you must inform the customer or whoever's personal data you'll be storing about the amount and extent of personal data you will be storing, the reason you'll be storing it, and the length of time that you'll be storing it for. Um, it needs to be unambiguous which means that long gone are the days of burying a user under pages and pages of EULA or consent forms. Uh, if you think about cookies, sometimes they're super cryptic. This will not be tolerated anymore. Now, for this presentation, we won't talk so much about consent because it's more a legal thing as opposed to something that has to do with Domino. But if you were to do a little bit more reading on the subject, feel free to do so. There's a couple links here and I will up upload the presentation to SlideShare later on. Now, another very important concept here is the data, pro data protection officer. And there's already some misleading information on the internet where they say, if you're smaller than 250 um, employees, then you do not have to have a, an appointed data protection officer. This is actually untrue. It comes from an earlier draft of the regulation but as of today, you must have a data protection officer who will essentially be the face of your organization and responsible for all things data privacy, okay? Um, there's a couple of exceptions if you look at the, the regulation, um, but it's extremely, extremely vague. And so thereby, my conclusion would be that it's best to appoint a DPO no matter what, um, no matter how um, small the company is, it's best to have someone like that. Now, when it comes to Domino, um, chances are that your organization not only uses Domino, and so the larger the organization, the less the chance is that the DPO will come from a Domino background. So for this presentation, we'll more talk about and we'll focus more on how you, as a professional who works with Domino in an admin or developer or IT manager capacity, can help your data protection officer serve and extract data from Domino, as opposed to just looking at all of this from a data protection officer standpoint. The other thing that's very important about the GDPR uh, is that it's not just legal stuff. It also has a lot to do with cybersecurity. And so one of the important things is that um, you have an obligation to report data breaches uh, within 72 hours of detection. Now, when it comes to data breaches, it's important to define what this means. Uh, essentially, this means that data is lost and results in um, any kind of damage to the natural persons whose data you're storing. Um, you must report these to the relevant authorities. Um, for example, well, actually, this is the information commissioner's office in the case of European authorities. Like I said, within 72 hours of detection. Um, one example of a, of a major data breach like that is the Sony hack that happened a couple of years ago that actually resulted in not only personal data exposure, but also this is how we found out that some of the actresses made much less money than actors in Hollywood, right? Uh, as part of Sony production. So that's one of the examples of such a data breach. Now, interestingly enough, um, the whole point about cyber attacks is that you must report um, data breaches within 72 hours of detection and not when they actually happen. 
when you look at this article, actually, this was done by FireEye, but I've actually seen the Mandian security report for 2017 as well. It has similar results is that the average for intrusion detection, the average time to detect a data breach is actually 146 days globally. But when you look at the European Union and the EMEA region, it goes up to almost triple, which is that the average time that it takes for organizations to notice such breaches is actually 469 days. So you can sort of think of this as an incentive to make you more efficient in monitoring your environment as well, even though in this case, if you do notice the intrusion only 400 days after it actually happened, your obligation is only to report it within 72 hours and there won't be any penalties because it took such a long time. All right, um, another aspect of, of cyber attacks here is that while the GDPR, and, and I mean, it's, it's pretty high level for now, and we don't really have any practical examples of how the GDPR will be enforced. One of the things is that, I mean, we're pretty sure that there will be GDPR audits once it starts to be enforced, and it will probably be really high profile cases, think Facebook or Google, um, it is, and it is, I mean, I have this analogy here that it's a little bit like driving under the influence. We know that we shouldn't be driving, but before the GDPR, it was a little bit like, well, you shouldn't drink as much when you, when, when you drive, right? With the GDPR, it's actually sort of a zero um, uh, percent tolerance in a way. And so when do you actually get fined? Well, you could get pulled over, which would be the equivalent of an audit for the GDPR, but if you're part of any accident, whether it's your fault or not, and it turns out you've been drinking, that's when you get fined. And so that's gonna be very, very similar for the GDPR as well. Now, another really important thing here is the data subject rights, because like I said, all of this is about the data subjects, about the natural persons whose data you're in control of. So what is it that the GDPR allows them to do? First of all, right of access. They'll be able to ask you questions about whether you process any personal or sensitive data. Um, where is that data processed? For example, is it processed only inside the EU or outside as well? What are the purposes of processing? And who is, your, is their data shared with? And for how long you're keeping that data? They'll be able to ask for rectifi rectification. So if any data is actually out of date or incorrect, you must comply and you must allow them to have that data modified or deleted. The right to be forgotten, and this is again, it comes down to the internet doesn't forget. Um, it must be able to forget if asked for um, as of now. Um, interestingly enough, um, there's a paper that I linked here is that Google did a case study and they keep updating this stuff. Ever since 2014, they received over 655,000 to be forgotten requests. Yeah? Um, so this is gonna be pretty important stuff. Essentially any individual from the EU can ask you to permanently remove any data that pertains to them. Now, it's not like you have to comply blindly because you can make a case, you can actually explain why the data is required and of course, when it comes to HR data here, so if it was a previous employee, then those contracts that you make your employee sign will be binding. So there is a little bit of flexibility here, but the principle and the rule of thumb is that anybody at any point can ask you to remove any sort of data you store about them. The right of data portability. So anybody can ask you for a copy of any and all of their personal data that is in your possession. All right. And the right of objection, they can at any point ask you to stop processing the data um, unless you can legally prove that you need it to, to, to continue. So the other thing, well, there's, there's this thing, and this is extremely vague, uh, right? Not to be evaluated on the basis of automated processing. If you think about Domino, this could actually mean that there is an agent somewhere that makes a decision based on parsing a CV somewhere um, and without any human interaction. To me, this part is extremely vague and I can't wait to actually see how this will be enforced in real life. This is, however, one of those rights that individuals have is not to, made, uh, not to be made a decision upon 
by an automatic process without any human involvement. All right, and so let's actually move on to Domino. Um, I want to start by debunking some of the hoaxes or fake news about Domino and GDPR. In the past few weeks, I came across this article, and a lot of our friends from the community also talked about it, which essentially states that Domino, that there is no way that Domino can be compliant with the GDPR. And they say that the only way to make it compliant is to get your data out of Domino and into SQL databases that are easier to search. And I have to say this is flat out false. I mean, when you look at the article, it's actually written by a salesperson anyway. So it's more about pitching their product than anything else. But it's important to realize that wherever, I mean, Domino does have shortcomings when it comes to um, the whole, um, and we'll talk about this in a second, it does have some shortcomings, but there's ways around it. However, it has major, major advantages too. Um, if you look at the fact that Domino, for example, isn't prone to SQL injections, that's a major thing here as opposed to SQL databases, right? Now, I don't know about you guys. I have not heard about a major high profile data breach that would have involved Domino. And when you look at the exploit database, the last publicly available exploit was happened over two years ago. And it actually requires that you have your names.nsf accessible and open from the web, which is a basic um, common practice not to do. And so one of the first things that you would do when it comes to security. The one before that was in 2013. So Domino is extremely, extremely secure as opposed to SQL databases. Um, and that's a major advantage right there. Um, all right, so let me just see where I am. Um, indeed, so Domino has everything that you need to build the tools um, that make you able to be compliant. Um, essentially, we'll, we'll see the path that you need to take to sort of prepare your environment to be compliant with the GDPR. And the, the truth is, is that no matter what software you, you use, Office 365 or Domino or Connections, complying with the GDPR will require significant legwork when it comes to mapping out what data you have and where. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. And so let's actually get started with Domino as a data container. What is it that counts as personal data in an NSF database? Like we said earlier, anything that makes it possible to identify a European citizen individual will count as personal data. And so I actually um, will talk about three different things here, actually mainly two of those, because obviously we have custom applications. Uh, we'll talk more about documents um, because that's the lowest level of entity in an NSF database. And so when it comes to um, GDPR compliance, our um, the thing to think about here is domino databases and how do we see what is inside those databases. So essentially any documents that contain an item with a person's name count as personal data. Of course, there is also the matter of attachments. So any attachments that may contain personal information, whether that's in custom app or mail files, um, such as CVs, for example, will also count as personal data. As far as mail files go, um, email correspondence to an individual counts as personal data, okay? It has their names and it might have other sensitive information, whether this is an employee or a customer, it counts as personal data. And of course, again, when it comes to attachments, this is also important to take note of. And technically, when we look at system databases, because the, the, the rule of thumb and the basic principle is that anything that contains a name or an IP address will also be personal data, um, entries in your log file or DOM log or any of these system databases that identify a user or even a person document that identifies the computer that the user was using or the IP addresses that they've used, these count as personal data as well. So what is really the challenge for Domino? Like I said, we have major advantages as opposed to other platforms in terms of security. And like we said earlier, that's an important consideration for the GDPR anyway. The major challenge that we have is that no matter what sort of request we receive from data subjects, that could be an access request, 
access uh, requiring information about the data that we store about an individual whether it's a rectification or a right to be forgotten request or a data portability request all of this starts with search so that's why we'll be focusing on this particular subject um, a lot later on because this is a major challenge for domino um, as opposed to for example office 365 we do not have a portal where we would just simply go and put in a search term and be able to just scan everything that we have in our domain, including databases, attachments, and all of that. However, like I said, we will be able to do native solutions to address this, as well as we as Ytria have solutions for it, and I'm pretty sure there's other companies that will provide some help in this department as well. So that is our major challenge. Um, before we go any further, there is a big difference here that we need to talk about when it comes to um, the when it comes to Domino in Smart Cloud versus on-premises, right? So we mentioned earlier that the data controller, in case you have your mail files, for example, in, in the IBM Smart Cloud offering, the data controller is still your organization. This is, that goes without saying for on-premises, right? However, the data processor, in the case of IBM Smart Cloud, will actually be IBM, whereas in on-premises installations, it will be your organization. As far as who your Domino data is shared with, um, in the case of IBM Smart Cloud, it is shared with a third party. Um, IBM will have access to that data and it will be outside the EU depending on your data center. I mean, even though there are data centers in Europe, that's not a guarantee at this point. With the on-premises installs, this is fully up to you and it depends on who you share those databases with right? Because you could share it with individuals outside the EU. You could actually have it replicated even without knowing to data centers or servers that belong to your organization, but outside the EU. So this stuff is going to be extremely important. Now, scope of GDPR compliance. And so this is where IBM Smart Cloud has a leap. Well, actually it has an advantage over on-premises installations because uh, with IBM Smart Cloud, it's actually IBM's responsibility to um, scan the data um, in case you receive a subject, uh, a data subject request. However, they have the advantage that this is mail only, and every mail file in the IBM Smart Cloud, uh, actually on IBM Smart Cloud servers, will be full text indexed. So they have the possibility to mass scan those mail files. When it comes to on-premises installations, this is not just about mail, but also applications. And that's going to be a biggie. Because as we know, and that's what we love about Domino, being no SQL means there's no guarantee that if you're searching for specific items, those items will exist everywhere. So that's why we're going to get to the point uh, where we examine the steps of making yourself uh, GDPR compliant it will require you to, pro to, to document data processes and look into your databases to identify what are the documents and what are the data structures that you store so that you can enable your databases to be searched on the mass scale. All right, so what would be the ideal GDPR readiness for Domino? Like I said, from our perspective, people who work with Domino or even as an organization like ourselves who barely use anything else than Domino, for our core business operations. Um, we would love it if we could just simply, um, upon a data subject request, perform a Domino domain search and get the results, right? Because that's basically what you need, whether this is just an access request, so simply requiring information about um, what's where um, for a given individual, or if they want to be erased from our system, first we need to find everything we have about them, right? Now, as you probably know, and, and as you can see, this is not something that, current, that is currently supported in the native way that Domino works. However, there's a way around it. How do we actually perform these sort of searches? How do we um, make ourselves able to respond to such requests? I actually divided the steps into three different um, um, steps here. The first of it is you need to create an inventory. And this is true even if you're not just talking about Domino. Um, 
I actually am in Europe at the moment and I, I, I work in a shared office, which is really a lot of fun. A lot of the people here work with GDPR as well. As a matter of fact, there's a major jewelry manufacturer that I'm not allowed to name whose data protection officer is sitting right across me. And there's a couple of other people who work with this as well. And they use Exchange and they're banging their heads against the wall the same way that we are because they still must be able to scan mail files, for example, and document everything that they have. Now, I would say that we have an advantage because most of these business applications will be on Domino. So first of all, we need to do the legwork and establish a list of the NSFs and figure out how and where do they replicate, what countries do they go to. The second part, and this is what will be the most work, but like I said, this is true no matter what IT systems and software you use, is you need to profile your databases according to their type, and you need to figure out which of those databases may contain personal data, okay? Um, another thing that's important here is not only is it important to profile your databases, but it's important to profile your potential data subjects as well. So what I'm talking about here is that, um, and I will give you guys a personal example from our scenario, from our standpoint, is that you need to sort of divide your data subjects into different categories. If you operate in multiple countries in the EU, you might want to do it country by country. However, you might want to do it customer by customer. So we'll talk about this in a second, but there's going to be an important requirement here to sort of profile your databases and figure out the types of data subjects who might ask you for information. And then after that, you need to understand once you, you actually mapped out the databases that may contain personal data, uh, you need to understand the structure of those databases, the personal data and its extent. What is the personal data that you store? What are the items on those documents? Would it just be first name, last name, or email address, or any other information such as IP addresses, right? And the other very, very important thing here is that you need to be aware of access rights. And the reason for this is that when somebody asks you and submits an access request, not only will you have to give them what data you have about them, you will need to share with them who that data is shared with. And so in our case, that will have to do with ACLs and we'll find that relying on ACLs alone will not be enough because it does not give you a, an unambiguous list of people that have access to databases. So access controls and security is gonna be extremely important from this standpoint as well. All right, um, so after you've done this work, and I realize this is a lot of work, um, and I have outlined these steps, and I believe this is the right way to go. I mean, the profiling of all things, because a lot of our customers have actually over 10 or even 100 servers and hundreds of thousands of applications. So the sheer size of data volumes is extremely intimidating. And there is no way that you can perform a, an enterprise search, no matter with what solution across data sets like that. So it's important to sort of narrow it down to the databases that you know might contain data that you need to give information about. So what is it that it would look like? It would look something like this. This is super simplified, right? Um, after the data discovery, we found that there's a bunch of databases that have to do with customer data that I actually marked in um, pink or rouge, if you like. So these are CRM databases. Apparently they replicate on two different servers. Then there's a bunch of sales people mailboxes that might contain that sort of data. Then we have a support database and a, a person who's in charge of support. So in case an actual customer would ask me for um, or submit an access request, these would be the databases that I would scan. And at the same time, there's a different type of data subjects here, which is um, HR data. So we would have a careers database somewhere in a web server that could hold CVs and whatnot. We could have an HR salaries database, which could hold sensitive information from salary to gender to age and stuff like that. And we have identified some of the mail files that belong to our HR department. So these would be completely different data processes and data flows. And this is extremely important to make your response times reasonable and to make your searches efficient. So 
Um, data mapping in real life. Um, and let me give you guys an example here. Um, basically, we have already received, uh, we as Ytria have already received our first um, data access request from a customer. Uh, they had an up, uh, upcoming renewal. And so because in this particular situation, we store some information about their employees, they would actually be the data controllers in this case, because they control the data on behalf of their employees who are European citizens. We are the data processor. And so they actually asked us for proof that we're compliant with the GDPR in the sense that we would give them the chance to um, permanently delete whatever we store about them, as well as um, as well as they asked for a copy of whatever data we have about their employees. Now we've actually gone through the data mapping and the discovery that I mentioned earlier, and so what this showed us is that we have two databases in total that store what we would consider personal data about these end users. Um, and we identified any mailboxes that might have had contact with these customers. And these would be everybody that um, is part of sales as well as support. And we've identified a mailing database that would uh, potentially hold correspondence with these end users. And so what we needed to do is first scan our two databases that were CRM databases to find any information about those people. Then we went ahead and used a scan over all of our mail files, including our support mailbox to find any correspondence with those people. Um, and we actually declared that in order to, that, that as far as support mails go, which go into a central mailing database in our system, uh, we need to keep those emails for training purposes. However, upon request of deletion, we would provide the chance to get those emails anonymized. So we would basically strip any personally identifiable information from those emails and retain the data from it only for training purposes so that we can search for it later on. So this is a real life example. And I know our, our environment is probably much smaller than you guys' is. I just wanted to provide a real life example. Um, this is what a, an access request would actually look like. So, Let's talk about locating personal data. Like I said, the key here is search, search, and search. And our best friend in this case is full text indexing. Not only because it kind of brings um, data search as well as searching indexed attachments under the same roof, um, but also because you can mass enable this, okay? Um, I'm not going to say when we move on to the white tria side of things, I'm not going to say that what we do here is impossible because you can certainly create a solution that will mass, that will actually process multiple databases and perform a full text index search over multiple databases. This is fully possible to do in Lotus Script or Java or whatever. Um, and kind of the downside of this, right? The downside of full text indexing is, is that it might and it will come with storage sacrifices, right? And so one of the things is that we probably don't usually index custom applications, but it makes your job so much easier as far as the GDPR goes. So once you've identified those applications that hold sensitive and personal information, and even if you're a large organization, you will probably not find as many databases as you think um, you will, because it's pretty particular now, in any case, once you've got them full text indexed, it's just a matter of being able to process multiple databases. Now, if full text indexing isn't an option, there is still options that you can choose. For example, you can perform searches via different methods. Um, we will look at some white tree examples later on. Um, you can, of course, search by formulas, Lotus Script, or even Java. Sort of the downside of this, I mean, it has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that you don't have to sacrifice space because this stuff works without creating a full text index. The downside of it is that you need to know what are the items that store information that you can use to identify documents that contain personal data. So this requires that you probably doc that you properly document the architecture of the databases, what I usually call focus databases, as far as um, GDPR compliance goes. So that's another choice here. And of course, 
the issue that we have with Domino, and we talked about this, is that you cannot, and, and, and simply performing searches database by database will not be enough. So you will either need to build a solution that allows you to do this, or find a partner who does this, and shameless plug, that's exactly what we can do. Um, but you will need a framework um, that allows you to mass process multiple databases and uh, make your data subject requests and the response times efficient. So with that said, what would a process like this look like after you've done your due diligence as far as discovering and mapping your data in Domino? You receive a subject request. The first thing to do is to categorize the subject. So who is this? Is this a customer from Germany? Is this a customer from Spain? Then I would need to locate the focus databases that I have previously established could contain personal data from my customers, then I will need to scan them, right? Now, whether that's through full text index or some other methods, it doesn't matter. This would be something I need to do. Then I would need to uh, create an access report for any of those databases where I found the match because I need to be able to document who's had access to the databases that contained personal data about the individual. Then I would need to identify focus mail files, including mailing databases for any correspondence. And I would need to scan them for any emails or correspondence that my company, my organization might have had with those individuals. In the case of using IBM Smart Cloud, this would be a request that you forward over to IBM and they would perform this in their system and return the results to you. And then of course, you would need to provide an access and delegation report for any of those matching databases because they, they would indicate the scope um, of access that has been granted to those databases and thereby the personal data in question. It's important to note that the amount of time within which you must comply with such requests cannot exceed one month, except for very good reasons, right? But once you have the processes in place, I think that one month is completely um, doable. It also depends on the volume of requests that you receive, of course, um, the point is, is that this needs to happen within one month. All right. Um, so let's Hi, Ben. I, ju I just want to jump in really quick and uh, thank everybody who is uh, writing their questions in the Q&A. Um, just wondered if, uh, for those of you who haven't seen them, uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the, uh, the webcast. And for those of you on YouTube, if you could just keep putting your comments in, uh, we can see if we can get to them. Um, just Ben, I don't know if uh, you wanted to uh, wait until the end of the, of the presentation to get to the Q&A or address I the... will. I will try and address the Q&A now. And actually, okay. uh, this just reminded me that I forgot to some, say something in advance. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not a lawyer, right? So this stuff is, is, is legal, even though I consulted a lot of people who, are, who have mileage in this. I do want to say that I'm not a lawyer. So what I see here is right, but I'm not sure that I'm explicitly correct about all the tiny little details here. I mean, okay, I'm just sort of shooting myself in the leg here. I did want to say that before I look at the questions. So um, there is a question here. Uh, from Marco, if a subject doesn't ask me to be removed, to be removed, even if he is not active anymore, do I have to remove all of his data? Um, uh, this sort of depends on who that subject is, um, and this is one of the areas where I'm a little bit gray. Um, I mean, it's sort of not a black and white area. If this is an employee. Um, your legal department will come up with changes to the initial contract that will say that any emails that that subject has within your organization will count as um, intellectual property of the company. What I did here is that in some cases, if they uh, leave the company and then come back later on and say, um, I have some personal emails that I left in that mailbox, you must give them the opportunity to remove those emails, right? So back to the question, if the subject does not ask you to be removed, um, do I have to really remove it? Well, it really depends on the consent. So if this is a customer and like I said, as part of your consent um, strategy, you will need to define the length to which the data will be stored. So as long as you told them, we're going to store your data indefinitely um, or until you revoke consent, you'll be fine. 
uh, I realized that the whole um, time frames on this stuff is is really not something that we're so familiar with in Domino, given the fact that sometimes we find some databases left over from 95, right? So it's not something that we're so familiar with. This is supposed to be part of what um, uh, you need to communicate towards the customer. Um, Howard is asking if this applies to B2B. Uh, for example, a company sends me a purchase order and we capture the name of the purchasing agent, email, etc. If we remove that info, then we remove the audit trail that says that person authorized the purchase. That's a great question, Howard. Uh, as a matter of fact, the example that I gave, and I, I apologize for that, um, I wasn't very specific. So our example was also a B2B example. So this was a customer, this was a company who reached out to us. But what really, really matters here is that the legal individual who might have signed that purchase order, right? If they are a European citizen, then it counts as personal data. And so you would actually be the processor while the company that you receive the purchase order from is actually the controller. So um, if they do reach out to you as far as deleting that data or an access request, um, anonymizing the data is actually a great way to go. So that's something that the GDPR explicitly says is that if there's no way to connect the dots, if there's no way to connect the data that you store to the individual, for example, removing the only item that contains their email address and their name and, and the rich text item doesn't, doesn't contain anything else, then you're completely fine. And, and this doesn't count as personally identifiable information. Um, so Donald asks, uh, would an attachment such as a scanned image capture of say a driving license count as storage of personal data? Unfortunately, yes. And, and one of the things that I didn't even mention is that we're not just talking about online data, we're talking about offline data as well. And that's where uh, GDPR compliance can be a little bit like a dragon whose head you cut off and then three others come out is that tracking offline data is extremely, extremely tough, right? Um, now scanning an attachment such as a, an image that contains a license plate number, honestly, I'm not even sure how you would be able to identify that as personal data by any way, because if it's attached to a specific document, um, I mean, you cannot scan the attachment itself. Uh, if the document is anonymized and you do not find it, uh, this is actually an area where I'm not sure. I don't see that this is feasible uh, or doable in any way, whether it's about Domino or not. But yes, it would be personal data because the license picture would actually identify the individual as well as give you sensitive information about the individual as well. Um, Andreas is asking if Deos files are not encrypted, you have a potential security problem according to the GDPR requirements. Um, that's a good question. Um, so if they're not encrypted, to be honest with you, I never actually played with the NLOs in terms of opening them up and seeing what I can access. If you can get access to them uh, as a simple user, um, I would say that this is not worse than a security misconfiguration, which would, for example, uh, mean that any user in your environment um, has access to any other user's password hashes because you don't use the extended ACLs on your names and address book, which would expose personal data to other users, such as the password hashes, for example. So I don't think that this would be um, an external security issue. It is. Some, I would definitely say that encrypting the NLOs would be a good idea in this case. Um, wow, you guys are awesome. There's a lot of questions here. Uh, I'm not sure how, how I'm doing so far, but uh, I hope that this helps. Uh, Richard is asking about what happens if the ACL has changed over the years? Um, do you need to supply the ACL history? That is a very, very good question. Uh, to be honest, um, to be honest, the GDPR does not explicitly talk about security in this way. Um, what it talks about is that as part of responding to an access request, 
you must be able to tell the user who their information has been and was shared with. So if you want to answer the question properly, yes, you will want to, um, if, you, if you want to respond to this 100% accurately, you will want to grab an ACL um, configuration. And I mean, we're gonna talk about this in a bit, but ACL isn't gonna be enough. You will actually want a list of people with effective access over that database. However, one thing that I believe would make this easier is that even though um, you cannot possibly take a snapshot of all of your ACLs in an environment every day, um, there is a great audit trail for ACLs, which is the ACL history. So there would be any changes made to the ACL would be documented there. And so you could actually use that to make your um, response bulletproof. Um, another question is, um, all right, uh, I'm not sure that I understand this question is how can I recover the individual relationship between them and the data in a case of legal discovery? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but if the relationship cannot be recovered, I mean, if you need to retain um, personal data for legal reasons, such as being, being able to do um, e-discovery uh, or perform e-discovery requests or whatever like that, the GDPR specifically says that you are allowed to put that into your consent and you're allowed to refuse requests to delete this stuff based on legal reasons. So I would say that this is not required if you need that data for legal purposes but it needs to be clear from the beginning. Um, all right, so access report logs uh, should be incremented. I believe that this is sort of the same question that we answered before. I believe that when it comes to ACLs, and like I said, we're gonna take a look at this in a second. Um, should they be incremented? I don't, I'm not sure that this would be feasible and, and how long it should be. I believe that if you just pull a report of your current ACL and access situation, and provide a list of whatever those ACL changes might have been, which goes pretty long back in history, right? That would probably count um, as a way to explain what has changed over time. Um, another anonymous attendee is asking, is the company responsible only for data on servers or also for data on the employee's computers? Um, that is archive mail files that are only local. Um, from what I have read, this is a very important question that comes up with mobile devices that are in the company's possession. As far as I know, this counts as personal data as well. Um, okay. Let me come back to these a uh, little bit later. Um, and, and let's see that we, that we actually finish on time and we'll spend some more time answering questions. Thank you guys for the interaction. This is always amazing. Um, when we get questions, I, I love the interaction and everything. Um, so keep it up. <coughs> All right. So we actually got to the white tree apart. And like I said, um, we can actually help with a lot of this stuff. Um, we can help with three different phases. And I, I, I've noticed a lot of you guys are actually white tree users, which I'm extremely happy about. I also just so happen to know that there are IBM customers here who, who might never have used their solutions before. So I'm definitely gonna keep this short and sweet, um, but basically our solutions will help you through and with three parts of what we talked about, right? First part is discovery. Like I said, this is something that's inevitable to do. Um, and if we didn't have tools in this department, I would still say that this is inevitable you need to be able to overview your, your environment and figure out what databases you have, what are the databases that contain personal information or customer data or whatnot. And replication is an important aspect of this, right? Because it has direct implications on where those databases are. Uh, we'll take a look at all of this live um, in a little bit. Uh, the next thing that I believe is our biggest competency when it comes to GDPR is that we offer you the framework and the means to extend your search capabilities from one database by a database, we can actually perform multi-database, in fact, even multi-server 
um, searches both using full text index, any formulas, or looking at specific meals, or even attachments. So we can do this with multiple files. And um, in the case of formula searches, for example, we'll see a couple of examples later on. Our average processing time is about one second per mail file, uh, because formulas are extremely fast. Full text index search is a little bit slower. So again, it's important to kind of narrow down the scope of databases that you want to search. Um, but extended search is something that we're really, really good at, and I'm super excited to show it to you guys. Um, access documentation is another thing that we uh, can support. In fact, like I said, ACL reporting is not good enough. And this is not a sales pitch. Uh, this is actually the truth. When you look at an ACL of a specific database, you do not have any native interfaces in Domino to get a simple list of who has access to that database and why or through which ACL entry. So what we did in our ACL Easy tool is we actually extended the effective access calculation feature, which is an awesome feature. It allows you to calculate what an individual can do with a database. And we extended this to as many users against as many databases as you want. And I will show you an example of this working across multiple servers to evaluate the effective access rights of two users across three different servers in two clicks. Now, a little bit of an introduction as far as uh, what we do here. And I know, like I said, some of you haven't used the tools before. Our biggest added value has always been that we took the overview that you can gain over an individual database or an individual server when it comes to ACLs or agents. Our tools, which are individually compiled C++ compiled solutions that run next to Domino, installed only on the client, so not on the server, they can be thought of as special notes clients, we always provided a higher level overview of the environment. So that's sort of our core competency. And when it comes to these searches, which I mentioned, extended searches, these are features that we offer in our product ScanEasy that is sort of a Swiss army knife for managing database content. This tool is actually something that probably most of you are familiar with. Um, it's a tool that works on one database at a time. So we would normally be able to perform these searches database by database. However, a couple of years back, we started building an application programming interface for our tools where you can instruct our software to perform certain operations, such as a full text index search, and have ScanEasy perform this set of actions on any number of databases automatically. The same thing is true for um, access documentation. We would be using our tool ACL Easy, which is a tool that offers an overview of an individual server and all of the ACLs on that server. We can use our automation API to extend this operation to as many servers, as many databases as we want. And so this is how we can gain a report on effective access situations across multiple servers for as many people as we want. So that's kind of enough of the introductions here. Let me actually jump into the demos. Um, I will head over to my uh, demo environment first. Actually, let's get started with the full text index search. Now, this is the part that I have the most issues demonstrating, uh, believe it or not, uh, is because I have a demo environment that's already about 50 gigabytes big, so I couldn't actually add those full text indices. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you um, this live in our own environment. Now I'm in Europe at the moment and our server is in Canada. So latency plays a role here, but basically I loaded up one of our mail servers and I basically selected three mail files. Now, as I said, this is database easy. Database easy is our tool that we will use as a control panel to select the mail files that we want to scan. All of these mail files are actually full, full text enabled. Um, and so I'm going to use an XML file, which you can see here. It looks really intimidating. However, you will have access to all of this stuff later on. The only thing you need to change is this particular string. So this is the string that I'm looking for. I'm going to be looking for a specific 
expression and use a full text index search on three different databases. Let's see how this looks like in real life. I'm going to select the three databases. I'm going to head over to execute automation file on ScanEasy. So I'm going to basically pass the instructions onto ScanEasy to process these three databases. And I will select the, mail, the XML file in question, which will be the full text index search XML. And you'll see how ScanEasy basically starts processing those three mail files. Um, and whatever it finds is added to a My Selection. For those of you who know ScanEasy, um, will then grab those uh, documents and will export them into an Excel sheet, which will conveniently show us any matching documents in those databases, as, as well as give us a note link to the documents themselves. So I know I'm just processing three databases. It's a server that's so when you would do this in your environment, which I encourage you to do, the, um, the performance of all of this would probably be about 20 or 30 times better as long as you do it on a local server. So we're actually done with three mail files. Like I said, this is stuff that actually takes a little bit of time. And so let's take a look at our report. We looked for the search term GDPR FDY. We scanned three different mail files and we found two mails in each of these and one in this particular database. And what we did also is using ScanEasy, we provided a notes link, um, which I could quickly turn into a, a, a hyperlink because that's a notes link and I just click on it and I'm right there. So this is the ability to use full text index searches across a number of databases. And I believe it or not, I actually had a lot of fun doing this stuff earlier um, in our own databases, so not in my demo environment because I don't have that many emails there. But of course, I mean, we're talking about some sensitive data here, so I couldn't really show that. It's pretty amazing being able to scan all of our mail files to look for a specific customer that we might have talked to in the past and stuff like that. So that is our full text index capabilities. Um, on to the next thing. Like I said, if there is no full text index um, in place, we might want to use formulas. And so I prepared a script that allows you to scan mail files and it allows you to scan them extremely, extremely fast. <coughs> Apologies for that. Um, we have the XML file right here. Essentially what it does is it will perform a formula search for the data subject name. Now, right now I'm, I'm gonna look for a guy and, and basically we're looking for any emails um, that were sent to, copied to, or from this specific person, okay? So this is gonna be a formula search and this is gonna take a little bit of time because every single mail file that we'll process will contain data from, these, uh, from this individual. So this is gonna be a little bit more heavy. I'm gonna, again, use our product database easy and I'm gonna simply load our mail file folder. So that's gonna be all of my mail files and I'm gonna just, in the interest of time, um, go with a subset of these mail files. Uh, some of them I couldn't even open because I wasn't authorized to. However, if I wanted to, I could sw simply switch to full access administration direct from here. Like I said, it's sort of like an old client. And so I'm gonna select a subset of these guys. I'm going to execute an automation file on ScanEasy. And I'm going to select the mail search script, which will look for any emails sent to, received from, or copied to the individual of my choice. So I'm gonna open this and we'll see how fast it actually processes those databases. Like I said, in this case, every single one of those mail files contains um, information about this individual and emails from and to this individual. This is important to say because if we do find matching documents, it takes a little bit longer, I would say, by the looks of it, and it depends on the data volume, it sort of averages um, at around three to five, six seconds per database. However, in a real GDPR discovery scenario, um, you will, the majority of your mail files will not contain matches, right? For an individual end user or an individual um, that you're looking for. And so the average time that it takes for us to process a mail file um, that does not contain a match because of the speed of formula searches is around one second. So it would take about a thousand seconds to scan a thousand mail files. And that I think is a really remarkable speed. We have used this automation feature at multiple customers before. 
not just for GDPR, but for other things as well. And so let's actually see what we have. Now, we get an error here because not all of them uh, contained apparently something in this department, but we also get the report for our mail scan results. And let's see what that looks like. Like I said, the majority of selected mail files contained emails from this individual. We actually documented the data subject that we looked for. These are the databases. And so you can see that the report is fairly large. It actually, I would say it didn't take more than a minute to complete, but we created uh, about a thousand lines here, actually over a thousand lines. These are all the matching documents for this particular query. Now, of course, when it comes to the XML itself, you have the opportunity to change this, to customize this, because right now we're only looking at um, those three fields, but this is a script that you could easily modify to work with custom applications, as long as you have properly discovered and documented what are the fields that would contain personally identifiable information. So this is how we can extend formula searches across as many databases as we need to. And then there is another subject here, which is attachments, right? Now, as long as you have everything full text indexed, and in a way that attachments are also um, full text indexed, you should be fine with an FTI search. However, if you wanted to look at a particular file, and this is kind of a huge animal here, because if you think about the following scenario, let's say we have an HR database and we receive a CV from someone. Um, the hiring manager or whoever the HR person is forwards it to the hiring manager asking for an opinion. The hiring manager forwards it to two of the people on the team. And so we sort of already quadrupled the amount of personal information in the network. How do you actually find it uh, later on, right? Because this counts as not only personal, but probably even sensitive data. So we actually wrote a script. This is all ready to use that would allow us to look for attachments with a specific name across as many mailboxes and as many databases as we want. So let me just pull that up real quick. Okay, there's a typo in the file name, but never mind that. Um, essentially, I'm looking at this particular image that's gonna be a JPEG, and of course it doesn't contain any personal data, but it's just an example. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually select all of my mail files this time. Well, everything that I could um, actually open. And I'm going to execute this automation file on all of them, because I know for a fact that this attachment is not going to be everywhere. So I want to show you guys how fast it is to actually scan mail files that don't contain the attachment. You can see how um, the mail file names are changing on the left. Now, we actually found a match in this particular mail file, so we're exporting it. And then we're just basically going on to the next one. We found two memos in this case, but I think that should probably be it. And you should be seeing how it changes to the next mail file and goes pretty, pretty fast as long as we don't find emails with the same attachment. So what we're using here as a key is the attachment name, but you can also refine this a little bit more and also consider the size, name, and some other stuff about those attachments to be sure that it's the same thing. <coughs> so that is our search. It should actually be done momentarily. Um, and then we can take a look at the resulting um, Excel sheets. You can see that we selected 24 databases here. We're gonna be done processing in about a minute or two at the max. So when you add this up, this is extremely, extremely efficient. And I do wanna emphasize once again, this is not something that's impossible otherwise, but you do have to build a framework around it if you want Domino, um, or if you want to build an application that does this automatically. So let's take a look at our um, attachment search results. Oops, okay. Um, let me just let me just close these guys up. So uh, this is what our results look like. We can see that we didn't find it in all of the mail files that we processed, but we did find this particular email in these mail files. We can actually see the attachment found. What is the name of the attachment? And again, we did include a notes link. So if we were to um, respond to a data access request in particular, um, related to this particular attachment, then this would be the way to discover um, where that attachment has been forwarded in the environment, which I think is something that would be extremely hard to answer to otherwise. And so that's our attachment search. 
Um, and there, there's one more thing which I touched on earlier, which was the access documentation. So how do we deal with the effective access stuff? Um, as I said, we have a tool called ACL Easy, um, which works with an individual server, every ACL on that server. And in this tool, we have the opportunity to um, calculate the effective access rights of multiple users. So I'm going to use Replication Easy as a control panel to select my servers, because in this case, I've got three servers running and I want to run an effective access report for two users across all of these three servers. I'm gonna just pull up the script really quickly so that you guys can see it's actually pretty easy to modify. Um, essentially, this is where I put my users. I could look for, I mean, in this case, I'm gonna looking at, I'm gonna be looking at anonymous and a uh, specific user. I could simply add another user by copying this line and modifying the username. And there's a couple other variations to this, like I could select a bunch of databases and uh, document all of the user effective access rights on those. So in this case, we're gonna look at two users across all databases across three servers. Now, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna use Replication Easy, which actually is a great tool for discovering what is inside your environment. It's a multi-server tool that is primarily focusing on answering questions regarding replication. However, it also allows you to look at every single database on every single server in your environment, which could be extremely helpful in the discovery phase when you need to identify what you have in your Domino environment. Now, because we're sort of running out of time here, I'm just going to go ahead and execute the automation file on ACL Easy. I'm gonna select the servers that I want to um, include in my report. I'm going to select the XML file that will do the job. And you'll see how ACL Easy comes up on server number one. And so the first thing that it does is it will load the databases. It will select all databases and gather every ACL entry from all of them. Then it will define the users that we want to calculate the effective access for. And the moment we get that effective access report, which is actually extremely fast, we'll dump that in an Excel sheet. And you can see that we're already on server number two. And the moment that this is done, we're heading over to server number three. And we're basically putting our results onto different Excel sheets um, for the sake of simplicity and the ease of um, overview here. So that's server number three, and the report should be done by now. And so we're actually done with the script. So that was extremely fast. We processed hundreds and hundreds of applications for two specific users. Let's take a look at what we got with this. Um, okay, yeah, I probably have to close up database. Um, ECL easy here real quick. So um, what did we get? Like I said, we processed three servers and we categorize those access rights by the user in question. So first, we see a list of every application on Acme 01, and we can see what Anonymous can do. And so you can see that the effective access is documented right here. Um, and not only do we show you what the effective access rights, along with all the flags and everything, right? So we can see the effective access, and we also show you why we have that effective access. For example, this database has anonymous set to designer because there is no anonymous ACL entry. It's because there is a default and it's set to designer. So not only do you get the actual effective access for every database for these users, you can actually also see why those users end up with those access rights. And this is our user number two and all of their access rights over databases on Acme 01. And that's the same thing for Acme 02 and 03. So essentially that is how we can extend the base of the white tree tool operations to multiple databases when it comes to in-depth searches, as well as to multiple servers, when it comes to discovering what you have in your environment and when it comes to documenting who has access to what. So with that said, um, those were the things that I wanted to show you guys. Um, all the XML scripts for those of you who are customers of Whitria will be available later on. And now let me just finish things up here really quickly and we'll then uh, let those of you guys go who didn't have any questions and we're going to attend to all of the questions. So there is a part that um, I did want to include here is that we have a new offering called the White Tree Tandem Jump. Uh, this is something that has been extremely uh, successful for um, 
different purposes. What we do essentially is we sit down with you and we spend two hours together in a remote session um, where we'll take a look at your environment and we use the tools and sort of take a look at uh, your environment through our products. Now, in these two, two hours, we will be able to address specific problems, including GDPR readiness, if you're interested. Um, this comes at a flat pricing of 500 US dollars. And I'm sorry, I know this is marketing-ish. They made me put this in here. <laughs> so that's the white shirt tandem jump. We've had really nice feedback about it so far. Let us know if you're interested. And the next thing is completely free. I just did want to say that we'll have a next webinar specifically about Domino security where we'll look at external and internal domino security considerations, threats and mitigation, as well as we'll take a look at some real life attack scenarios. Um, this will not really be about the GDPR, but I mean, security is really important for GDPR as well. The webinar is, and it's supposed to be already available for registration at ytria.com slash IBM Domino Security. So feel free to register if you guys are interested. Um, and so that will be our next webinar on April 18th. All right. So with that said, um, I wanted to thank you guys for attending the webinar. I really hope you found this um, useful and not boring and you learned something new. Um, I believe there should be a survey coming after the webinar. If you can let us know what you thought, that's always extremely helpful. Um, and uh, all right. Uh, let me go back to the questions then. Okay. So where were we? Uh, we answered a lot here. Uh, there was a question that's more like a statement uh, from Uwe. Um, who says you may not delete data if tax laws require you to keep that data. I completely, completely agree. This is one of those things that can be considered a valid reason for not complying with a right to be forgotten request, right? Um, there are another users asking about, well, actually that's also more a, a statement. Uh, there are ramifications for many other pieces of legislation, SOX um, being part of an American company and tax laws for two examples. So of course, uh, like I said, uh, all of these regulations are subject to uh, local laws as well. So if there's a conflict, that should be uh, something you can explain. Um, and that is a valid reason for refusing um, the right to be forgotten, for example. Uh, one example that I can give you on this particular scenario, I mean, it might not be the exact same thing, but I just read about Google going to court. And I mean, for these high profile companies, the GDPR is a massive, massive pain. Uh, Facebook actually announced uh, that they will be hiring 10,000 IT security professionals as a response to the GDPR. And Google is actually in court because they said they will comply with the right to be forgotten. Uh, for individuals if they ask for it. However, they refused to comply uh, with uh, erasure requests in regards to um, being mentioned regarding crime, if that makes any sense. So if, if you were to be in the news because of embezzlement, for example, or something like that, you would not have the right to um, ask to be removed on that. So that's also a really touchy subject there, right? Uh, and I'm not sure what exactly happened. I know that they're going to court about this uh, right about now. All right. Um, another anonymous attendee is asking, uh, you mentioned data subjects as living individuals or natural persons. If our client is a company, not a person, does their data count as personal data? Someone told me that a company name and the company logo also counts as personal information. I do not believe so. I really do not believe so. When you look at the regulation itself, it specifically says this is a real living individual. Um, so there might be other privacy um, questions and regulations here. For example, you obviously cannot use a testimonial from a company who did not explicitly agreed to you using their name or logo or something like that, 
but this isn't really within the scope of the GDPR. So I believe that it has to be a living natural person and not a company as a body. Um, now, again, back to our example, if it's a company asking you about their employees, that's a different story, right? All right. Um, <clears throat> what happens if a lawsuit comes in uh, after a user made a request? So I imagine that the question is what happens if a user made a request for uh, to be deleted and uh, then you get a lawsuit where this would be evidence. To be honest, that's a little bit above my pay grade. Um, I would imagine that data that you're responsible for or that might come up in litigation afterwards would need to be properly classified before outlining and, and defining your GDPR strategy. Um, so what I mean is that that removing data from these users, I mean, it's a really good question. To be honest with you, I do not know the answer to that because there might always be data that looks completely innocent and then it could be used in litigation later on. Later, later on I do not know. And uh, there's a lot of things about the GDPR that I'm extremely curious about uh, the moment it starts to be enforced. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna be starting to see some uh, high profile cases and we're gonna learn a lot about uh, these intangible areas because right now, all that everybody is doing is sort of guessing about exactly these sort of questions. So I'm sorry, but I, I cannot say anything with 100% with certainty. Um, Lota is asking about domino system fields like dollar updated by, which are really hard to anonymize. Um, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. Like I said, theoretically, anything that contains a name, even in your log.nsf, right, um, is supposed to be able to, to, to be wiped, wiped out. Um, one of, the, um, one of the, the good things here is that the dollar updated by uh, actually documents whoever has changed those documents, right? So that would more be internal employees than external customers who you're storing data from. Um, and so this would be a little bit different because when it comes to data created by your employees, that would be a different story. I mean, updated by um, can actually be anonymized. We even have a feature for that in ScanEasy, if I'm not wrong, which allows you to clean that up. Um, as well as for databases, you can actually define, I believe, a time limit of retaining entries in there. So that, that might be something to document. Well, honestly, I wouldn't worry so much about that. Um, Howard is asking about ACL history. So speaking about ACL history, hopefully most of your organizations use groups and not names in the ACL. So what you probably need is track uh, changes to those groups. Actually, that is a great question. That is a great question. So what this is about is I said that we could use a current um, snapshot of the ACL configuration as well as the effective access situation and then basically use the ACL history as some sort of an audit trail and you know what, you're right. Uh, this would not be enough because of course, if there's a group in the ACL which had people come and go, those people would have had access to uh, those databases. So I must actually uh, sort of excuse myself and go back on what I said earlier. Yes, in that case, I believe that regular snapshots of your uh, effective access situation might be required. Now, the good news is, is that what we saw with ACL Easy just now allows you to repeat the same job and you could use an XML script that essentially takes a snapshot of every single user against every single database, categorizes it by database. And so you could run this report, for example, every one month. So that, uh, that is an option that's out there. Um, Cormac. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so that's not a question. I got a nice compliment. So that's awesome um, about the multiple database searches with XML. Uh, like I said, uh, we are actually finalizing the XMLs for you guys. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and you will get the recording 
along with the XMLs that you can use. Another question, can employees use this law to remove themselves from DBs or this just applies to customers? No, this definitely applies to HR data. Um, this applies to HR data because um, we're talking about natural living individuals who work for your company. So the GDPR also applies to you if you're an American company that doesn't actually do business in the EU, but has some European citizens as employees, even though they might be working in the States. Um, now, this is the part where I'm a little bit um, unsure about the way that this is to be managed. However, I'm pretty sure that um, as far as employee data in your environment, uh, there will be legal changes to the contract of individuals. I mean, even today, uh, if you think about it, when someone starts working for you, they do not have the right to say that any software, for example, that they develop for your company belongs to them. It will be said in the contract that this is the individual uh, intellectual property of the customer, of, of, of the company. And so in future contracts, I believe it will need to be specified the amount of personal information that the customer and the company will need to store about those employees. So as long as the legal department is on board with this, um, um, internal employees will not be able to just say, let's remove everything that you have on me, right? Um, honestly, I did look into this a lot. I've also been in touch with a specific, uh, well, it's a, it was a GDPR specialized lawyer. As you guys can imagine, they're not very easy to come by uh, <laughs> or reach these days, and it's just gonna get worse. Um, this is a good question. I, I, I think we'll, we have yet to see how this will work, but I believe this is more up to the legal department than for us. Um, so Daniela is asking about how long back uh, should the access history be kept or made available? Um, that is a great question. Like I said, uh, the, the, the basis of talking about access history is that we need to be able to tell the, uh, tell the individual who that data might have been shared with. And so the issue is, is that you don't really have any means in Domino to work with usage data that goes way, way, way back, right? There's different sources of information you can rely on for usage, but working with the access, saying that theoretically, if I have 15 users, uh, that have access to an application, whether that's because they're part of groups or, or because the default is open or something like that, it counts as the data has been shared with those users. So that is the context in which we're talking about this, right? Uh, how long you want to keep track of that? Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Like I said, with ACLZ, nothing forbids you from performing these searches um, periodically. So I hope I, I did answer all of it. I know it's pretty apparent that I'm not uh, that I'm not a lawyer, right? Uh, I really try to stay away from anything that I wasn't sure about. Um, at this point, I'm not sure if there's anything else, Mike. If you're still there. Yep, I think that's it. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you, Ben, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your comments, your questions. Um, and we hope you found this webinar useful and uh, that you have now enough information to ask the right questions in the future and uh, that you're well on your path to answering any questions that you might have had. And if you do have any more questions for us or any feedback, um, send it to us at uh, support at ytray.com. And feel free to reach out regarding the previously mentioned tandem jump sessions. And... Uh, the recording will be available, so if any things you want to dive deeper in, uh, you'll receive the recording in your inbox, and uh, we hope that you found it useful. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.